We will, Krishna will collect all emails, yeah, from all attendees, and we will transfer, we will transfer the content of the slides to all of you, yeah? So in this case, you will not waste time for writing this now. You will concentrate on important things, but you can make notes on, a, on a oral uh, explanations and, and, and so on, so on. So number four is a sensors comprehensive survey. It's uh, edited by Wolfgang Geppel from Tübingen University and other professors. And here you have uh, some basic knowledge, basic terminology, basic terminology, basic definitions. Again, they are very important because, as I said, when you are talking, when you are attending a conference in Europe, to be specific, you are using two terms, sensor and transducer. Europeans have different <coughs> understanding of term sensors and transducer than Americans. And the same story is with many other terms. So always when you have a discussion with somebody, it's a wise to ask him a question. What do you mean by? What do you mean by such and such term? To be on the same wavelength, to have a good communication. So this first volume, Fundamentals and General, and general Aspects, and you have a, all definitions, we will go through them today, and uh, it helps you to communicate, communicate efficiently with other people. Yeah, there are several other, other uh, books. Uh, some of them were printed relatively, relatively long time ago. For instance, position, position six, current advances in sensors. I am recommending this position. Why? Because you know the situation in sensor technology field is a little bit similar to the situation with Volkswagen Beetle car, yeah? They are practically, if you look at the car, the shape is the same, so many years. Even modern version resembles old one. And several transducers used by industry, they were developed long time ago, but they are still in use. And they are very useful. They are simple, but very useful. So they are well described in this position number five. There is a book, uh, Nanotechnology Enabled Sensors, and some chapters are good, some, some. You have to be very critical when you are studying this. So this is some basic uh, stuff. Now. What is really recommended, you have to follow journals. But again, you have to be very careful because the number of journals publishing in nanos, on nanosensors is mushrooming, mushrooming. And l level, l the level is different. Some of them are excellent, others are not so good. Not so good. So again, you have to be very critical. But there are several journals, like Nanotechnology, uh, Sensors and Actuators B is very good. It's an old, old journal. Part A, Physical Sensors. Part B, Chemical and Biosensors. Sensors and Actuators B. Of course, they are well established, well established uh, in journals in physics, they are also publishing papers on nanosensors, like uh, Applied Physics Journal, is a very well-renowned journal. Uh, physical Chemistry, Chemical Physics, Material Chemistry, Physics. This is very good international journal of hydrogen energy. So if you are working on hydrogen sensors, you can publish in this journal. And uh, mm, some of the papers are very good. Some of the papers are very good. Now, 
you have to understand one thing, of course, and you know it very well, you already know it very well, that what we are reading in journals, what we are reading in journals, was done two years ago. Yeah? Because authors completed their tests, they wrote the paper, they sent to the editor, it took several months, and finally it's published. So the results are not the most fresh results. The best way to follow the progress in this field is to approach, approach the recent international congresses uh, proceedings. Now, I, I attended uh, three months ago, I attended uh, <coughs> Transducer Congress in Barcelona. This is the oldest and the most prestigious sensor congress in the world. It started in 1983, Transducers, and uh, usually is over 1,200 participants from all over the world. And this congress, I have a, I have a memory stick with, a, with all papers. So we can transfer this. So you will have, you will have the <coughs> recent advances in nanotechnology, because some part of this congress was devoted to nanosensors. Some part. You have the recent advances, really recent. Yeah? So it's for you. We can transfer this. I will give you memory stick. You will have papers, some nice papers regarding hydrogen sensing and others. So this is the literature. Now let's go briefly by content. Uh, as I already said, this is a area of enormous scientific and industrial, industrial importance because some markets are huge, big money involved, big money. For instance, sensors for automotive industry. Market is, of, on, is in the range of billions of dollars. I'm using Australian, how we are saying in America? Not billions, milliards? In America, milliards? Thousands of millions. Thousands for of one billion. Okay, so it's a okay, so it's a very huge market. Also, other markets will will go through applications. Now, my role is to equip you with fundamental knowledge of various types of widely used sensors. We'll we'll concentrate on certain areas because practically at this stage, at this stage, nano sensors are developed for both, they are both physical quantities, for physical quantities, and for chemical and biosensing quantities. But physical, physical, the activity is not so, not so uh, uh, intensive, so we will concentrate on chemical and biosensors, and bio nanosensors. We will discuss during the course, we will discuss mainly gas sensors, gas nanosensors, different type of gas nanosensors, and we will discuss nanomolecular sensors, molecular sensors. We already go, went through this, that this is very interdisciplinary area. Uh, Prior learning, the student is expected to be familiar with analog, digital electronics, physics fundamentals, solid state physics, chemistry fundamentals. Yeah? Capabilities. We will go, we will go through introduction to sensor technology. Introduction. We will discuss, we will discuss static and dynamic parameters because there are many, let's say, tricky aspects of this. We have to have a good understanding. And Dr. Olvera recommended me to discuss some basics. 
quickly. We will not waste too much time. Now, very important, very important remark at this stage. Several sensors, several sensors in general, they are manufactured by many companies, by many companies. For instance, temperature sensors. Everybody must measure temperature. In wide range, numerous applications. My, now, when you are the sensor user, my question is, can we trust the company glossy brochures? They are producing very glossy, very nice brochures. Can we trust them? Never. Never. Because the major role is to sell, to make money. Yeah? We have to be very careful what they are saying. Let me tell you the story. It's a beautiful story. Once Australian government Australia is very good in uh, safety problems. Australia was the first country in the world who introduced safety, safety belts in car. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And at the one stage, at the one stage when I settled down in Australia, I realized that we are measuring air quality practically everywhere. Everywhere. In airplanes, submarines, industry, military, in uh, many places, but we do not measure air quality in a car cabin, in a car cabin. When the driver, driver drives a car many hours, there is a deficiency of oxygen because it's confined space, tired, and as a result, accidents on the road. So I came to the conclusion that it's a good idea to measure air quality, content of oxygen, content of carbon monoxide, and content of some carcinogenic vapors like benzene. Benzene is carcinogenic, and we have to measure benzene concentration at part per billion level. So I sent a memo to Australian government in Canberra that my lab is very keen to develop such a system. Not only this, some people who are going to make, who are going to commit suicide, they are locking themselves in a car, in a garage, yeah? locking windows, turning on engine, and killing themselves. There are many such cases around the world. So, Australian government committed some money to develop such a system. Of course, the goal was to commercialize this system, this system, to introduce to the automobile industry. So every car should contain this, this system. As a result, we have to use commercially available sensors. Commercially available sensors, because this system will be commercialized in hundreds and hundreds of thousands. So, I look at all these glossy brochures and I was confused because all these sensors proposed were, according to the company, excellent quality. Excellent quality, yeah? So, I started to be very suspicious. What I did? I sent email to Silicon Valley to one of my postdocs who switched location to Silicon Valley. I asked him, what sensor what sensor do you recommend to use? And he replied in a very official manner. He says, this is not a policy of my company to give such advice. Why I ask them, these people? Because they are spending years and years testing commercially available sensors, yeah? For instance, they are testing long-term stability during two years' time. Two years' time. As I said during this plenary talk, as a as a, let's say, university people, we have no time to spend two years to test long-term stability. 
And fortunately, a few days later, I flew to California and I visited this guy. Chinese guy, he invited me for a dinner in Chinese restaurant. And face to face, he said, now I can recommend you, unofficial. And he recommended me particular sensors manufactured by Figaro company in, in Japan. Yeah, very famous company. So, again, coming back to the point, we cannot trust glossy brochures. We have to be very critical, even suspicious, suspicious when selecting. So, temperature sensors, temperature sensors, as I said, they are used everywhere, everywhere practically. We have to measure temperature on many places, different environments, different conditions, and so on, so on. So, we will go briefly few temperature sensing, because very important parameter, and I will show you, I will show you what does it mean trade-off, trade-off, because there's no such thing like an ideal sensor, ideal sensor. It's over a, if one parameter is excellent, it's always on the expense of other parameters. Nothing is for free. If sometimes I have an excellent sensitivity <coughs> for sensor, unfortunately, unfortunately, other parameters are not very impressive. So we have to understand that it's always trade-off between different parameters. And we have at least, at least 20, 25 parameters which should be taken into account. They must be taken into account. So, we'll go through temperature quickly. Uh, we, will then, we will then discuss overall introduction to the nanotechnology-based sensors. And we will discuss different transducing platforms. Because Three days ago, I was talking about optical-based gas and vapor nanosensors, but they also conductometric based on Schottky junction. They are also uh, based on uh, bulk waves, based on surface acoustic waves, and others. So we have to have a good understanding of these transducing platforms, and we also have to have some basic understanding of nanomaterials which could be used, which could be combined with this <coughs> transducing platforms. Fabrication techniques, briefly. Let me make a remark. One of the myths in the nanotechnology is that you have to have a millions of dollars. This is not true, as you already know. Yeah? Because you can have very nice chemical synthesis, very cheap approach, and you can get very nice morphology. One of my PhD students worked on zinc oxide, and he was using very simple approach, purely chemical, <coughs> chemistry-based approach, and he got wonderful morphologies, different sort of morphology. So we don't need, we don't need big money for this area. This is not true. We have to have a right approach. Uh, I don't know if micro characterization techniques, because we have to understand the material. But I am sure that you are already familiar with, because they are standard techniques like SEM, TEM, XPS, XRD, and some modifications. Raman spectroscopy, in situ Raman, very powerful, very powerful, because we can, we can understand what's going on during the interaction between gas molecules and nanomaterial, in situ, and others. And uh, we will go through gas and vapor nanosensors, uh, different type of gas and vapor nanosensors, and we will come finally to the uh, nanobiosensors, I will concentrate on very fascinating type of nanobiosensors. They are molecular 
receptor-based sensors, molecular receptor-based myosensors. I will go through the all stages of design, such a, such a molecular sensor. You will understand you will understand the degree of difficulty and you will understand the very multidisciplinary nature of this design. The team really very multi multidisciplinary. They were, they were molecular biologists, chemists, both organic and inorganic chemists. They were signal processing experts. They were also solid state physicist, very multidisciplinary team. That's a reason why I emphasize the need of basic understanding, basic engineering understanding, in order to communicate with other people, which have different background, we have different knowledge. Yeah? One of you, after lecture, I don't remember, asked me about the uh, what's going on with a uh, physical chemistry of surface, the Krishna, yeah? I replied that it's a very difficult task because he's a very famous Japanese professor, Yamazoe, who retired, but he's still very active scientifically. And he works through most of his life on models modeling the interaction of gas molecules with nanomolecules, with ma with sem mainly with semiconducting metal oxides. And uh, there are still many unknown, there are still many ambiguities, there are still many uh, unreplied questions in this. As I said that on the surface, sit L, L Diablo. Yeah? <laughs> On the surface sits El Diablo. Bulk is easy. Bulk is easy to understand, but surface is very difficult. It's very difficult. We have no full understanding of this interaction. But we have to do this job finally to have a to take the best from the sense of design. The best. To take the best means optimize the sense of performance. Okay, learning outcomes. Learning outcomes, what you should achieve. Uh, from this, understand the physical and chemical principles of operation of commonly used sensors. This is, this is for, this learning outcomes was for the big course. 45 hours, 45 to 60 hours. So we cannot expect that after, you know, limited couple of hours, we will be able to achieve all, all these outcomes. But partly, 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 we will understand the flavor of this area. That's right? Flavor. We'll have some basic understanding. We'll have the we'll make first step and later, later you will be on your own and uh, you will go deeper and deeper. Uh, this is important. Identify static and dynamic sensor parameters, derive critical sensor parameters. Specify fundamental performance limitations, employing different principles of operations. Each of the sensors and transducers have certain limitations. We have to understand what we can achieve. Because the major issue in nanotechnology is we have... Okay, let me, let me explain to you in, in, in these words. During the plenary talk, I mentioned on few occasions, on few occasions, that certain transducing techniques are well known from analytical chemistry. They were developed even 100 years ago. Nothing new. Absorption spectroscopy, reflection measurements, photoluminescence, 
chemiluminescence. These techniques are well known, but nowadays we observe a revival of these techniques because we are combining these techniques with a different type of nanomaterials, achieving a lot. Yeah? So, what does it mean, limitations? If we understand, if we will understand the limitations of every used, every employed nanomaterial, if we understand the limitations of every employed, potentially employed transducer, we can understand what we can achieve. There are many options, many options. The question is, how to combine, for instance, if I, am, if I have zinc oxide nanorods, well aligned, well aligned, very elegant verticular alignment to the surface substrate, can I combine them with surface acoustic wave based transducer? And how to do this job? Yeah, I have to, I have to think carefully, if this combination has a sense, maybe I have better transducer. But if I will come to the conclusion that surface acoustic wave transducer is a perfect for this particular uh, marriage of ZNO nanorods, how to do the job? There is a solution. I will use piezoelectric substrate made from lithium niobate or lithium tantalate, and I will use, I will deposit ZNO nanorods between transmitter and receiver. We will discuss everything in details later. And the ZNO nanorods layer could act both Yako as a guiding layer and gas sensitive layer. I will show you some modeling results. You will see that energy confinement to the surface is much higher in this case when I am not using intermediate layer. So I can expect much higher sensitivity. And this is the case. When I decide to use short key, short key uh, junction physical transducer, what I can expect from this. And I will show you several examples of hydrogen sensors which were developed in my lab based on Schottky. Wonderful transducing platform, wonderful. Why? You will see the results. For 1% of hydrogen concentration, the output signal without amplification without amplification for some combinations could be in the range of single volts. If I have an output signal, let's say two and a half volt, that's a wonderful result. No need for signal processing and very simple arrangement. We are always looking, we are always looking for simple solutions because simplicity is the highest level of refinement, in my opinion, in every aspect of life, not only in the engineering business, overall also in uh, every aspect of life. That's right? I will tell Alejandro later what sort of lunch we are eating on Saturday. Simple lunch, wonderful, with local people, yeah? The best. Yeah? Okay. So we have to understand limitations. We have to understand the physics, and, and limitations are coming from the physics. And we have enormous opportunities at this stage because we have many, many different types of nanomaterials, and we have a available different transducing platforms. These transducing platforms, again, they were developed for different applications, they are well known, well known, well known. 
But again, combining them with nanomaterials give us enormous opportunities. Uh, so we should understand the performance of a, a, a nanosensors and critically analyze and eff effectively communicate the results to other professionals. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of potential applications. We have to tailor the sensor design to the particular application. For instance, Hydrogen sensors are needed in industry. Hydrogen is a major culprit for metal corrosion. So we need sensors, hydrogen sensors operating at room temperature, possibly with low power consumption. At the same time, we need hydrogen sensors for automobile industry. They should operate up to, let's say, 800 degrees centigrade. In first case, we have to use different transducing platform than in a second one. Second one, we cannot integrate our signal processing system in silicon because silicon has a limitations. 150 is the higher operational temperature. Automobile industry, we have to use wide band gap semiconductors like silicon carbide, gallium nitride, and others. The sensor design will be completely different. So, this example, this example show clearly that sensor design should be tailored to particular applications. And that's a reason what I already said. If somebody asking me a question, General question. I'm always saying I'm not able to reply. Sorry. Give me the particular, describe the environment. Let's discuss the conditions, operational conditions, and now let's start to debate. There is no general reply. There is no general solution. There are thousands and thousands of different solutions. So, this Careful selection of transducer and selective thin films are important. We also have take, to take into account fabrication. I know that you have a different understanding of term fabrication. Because for you, it sounds like manufacturing. But it is not. Because fabrication, we are using this uh, university environment. We are fabricating in a clean university clean room. This is widely used term, fabricating. So, we have to take into account fabrication parameters. For instance, deposition temperature, deposition time, and others. If I'm designing transducer, proper transducer, if I have to deposit my nanomorphology layer using temperature 800, I cannot use certain substrates. I have to use completely different transducing techniques. Time is also important. So many, many parameters should be taken into account. Uh, so, to the end of this course, student will be able to identify the most appropriate nanosensor for specific applications, understand underlying sensing phenomena of the nanosensors, interpret the information presented by the above nanosensors, and uh, evaluate the influences of the interfering parameters on the nanosensor performance. Interfering parameters. What does it mean, interfering parameters? Sensor operates in a real world. Real world. There are many interfering parameters like temperature, humidity, vibrations, earth magnetic field, electromagnetic uh, mm, interferences, and so on, so on, so on. 
the sensor should be immune to all these parameters. So let's now make a short break and we will continue, okay? Mm -hmm. We'll continue after the break. Is there any coffee in this environment? <laughs>